Red Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Welcome to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, and we're coming to you live from the Hy-Vee Club Room, where 60 minutes of delicious radio is on tap. We have such a wonderfully delicious show. I'm so excited because we have with us Kelly Kinsler, Savannah Strode, Cody Remington from the Indian Hills Culinary Arts Program, and they are busy, busy, busy right now. Oh, I see the skin has come off that wild coho salmon. Interesting. All right. And they are making some, all the ingredients are ready to go for salsa. And pretty soon they're going to be getting everything together because the masa harina is here and they're going to be making tortillas from scratch. And this is going to be a, a very interesting and, and very, very educational show. Thank you very much, by the way. We appreciate your efforts. I'm, I'm thanking Tom Krupa, who had to go get us some masa harina, so we had the, the right stuff for the tortillas. Anyway, as we have done for many months, our health coach, Emily Rose Shaw, is here, and she is going to talk with us about brain food. <laughs> I'm sure that this is something I really need to pay attention to. <laughs> We've been talking about the connection between relationships and food. But now we've moved on to topics related to career and food, and I'm wondering what topic related to career are we going to be discussing? Today we're going to talk about six foods that help to keep you sharp and to help prevent dementia, and seven seven substances to avoid for brain health. Whether you have an active career and need to have mental clarity, or you're simply uh, looking to decrease your risk of dementia, these are all very important uh, foods to take into consideration. So about five years ago, my grandma was diagnosed with dementia, and so I definitely see how it impacts my entire family. So I really have an interest for, um, you know, what can we do to help prevent mental decline? So I'm going to give you a few facts about dementia and then move into the worst foods for brain health and mental clarity, followed by the best, and then what else we can also do to prevent dementia and mental decline. So dementia is caused by damage to the brain cells, and it's really a set of symptoms, a loss of recent memory, poor judgment, language difficulty, and it can really be caused by different cognitive conditions, but Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. And it's a couple of facts from the World Health Organization. 35.6 million people live with dementia worldwide, so that's quite a few. And in 2013, Alzheimer's will cost America $203 billion. So let's see what we can do. So what are the worst foods, and I'm sure beverages, that we could consume uh, in relation to uh, keeping our brain, uh, not keeping our brain healthy, I guess, is uh, where we're at. Well, there's a saying that what's bad for the heart is bad for the brain. So there's actually a link between poor cardiovascular health and poor brain health. So eating foods that damage the blood vessels and the heart may also damage the brain. So number one, saturated fat uh, clogs the arteries and leads to inflammation. So foods that fit that would be uh, red meat, full-fat dairy, and cheese. Those are examples. The second is trans fat, which causes inflammation and also hardens the arteries. And it's really found in a lot of processed foods. I know we've kind of talked about this before under the name hydrogenated oils. So look for that and avoid that. And next is added sugar. So refined white sugar, it does age the arteries and causes proteins in the body to actually function improperly. And then next is added salt, which we discussed when we talked about blood pressure. So um, added salt damages the arteries, potentially damaging the brain. Again, processed foods. Most of the added salt is found in um, you know, processed foods, packaged foods, and fast foods. And then refined white carbohydrates also ages the arteries. And then mercury. So if you eat tuna, I recommend to limit it to, limit it to one to two times a month. Um, as we'll find out, there's another option for fish. And then the last to avoid is um, fructose, mainly in high fructose corn syrup. Fruit also has fructose, but it comes packaged with a lot of fiber, a lot of nutrients. But still, I advise not to go totally bonkers on the fruit. 
maybe two to three pieces of whole fruit, two, one to three pieces of whole fruit, depending on uh, your body a day, I think would be good. Now, you didn't mention something I thought you would mention for sure, which is alcohol. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess I'm talking more about f foods themselves. Well, I guess some, well, of, some people use alcohol as food. Yeah, well, I definitely don't recommend that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what what can we consume to promote better brain health? So the opposite is also true. Uh, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So a heart healthy diet may also decrease blood pressure. So this is a new study that I I really do like, and it's uh, about chocolate linked to increased blood flow, thus better oxygen and improved memory and thinking skills. It was done with the elderly. They had, I think it was a couple cups of hot chocolate each day, and uh, they Swiss actually... Swiss Miss? <laughs> no, that's a good point. If you're going to have chocolate, which I, I like to have a little chocolate daily, really stick to dark chocolate. You know, chocolate is, it's a bean. It has antioxidants. A little bit of caffeine does boost um, your uh, brain power, but uh, just, just be weary of having um, too much of it. I would say like 70% dark chocolate or more would be a good rule of thumb. So that uh, brings up the next point, caffeine in moderation. A little bit can boost brain power, but too much can have the opposite effect, making you feel really jittery and not able to focus. And so I recommend green tea for the antioxidants and less caffeine. I personally drink yerba mate, a tea from South America. Um, I have for over five years. It really is a wonderful little ritual I have every morning. Um, I have a huge bowl of it. Bowl of it. And it gives me that nice little boost. With <laughs> I'll tell you, with, with between the smoothies and the yerba mate, I don't know. I mean, you must slosh all morning long. <laughs> I garden every morning, so I have to have a lot of energy, and uh, the combination is great. <laughs> uh, the next is really interesting, turmeric. India has one of the lowest rates of dementia, and they think it's because, um, on average, Indians have a tablespoon of turmeric a day. So turmeric is very anti-inflammatory. It also has a lot of antioxidants. Um, so I recommend having turmeric almost daily. That's interesting because you could you could make a little mixture of turmeric and a wonderful local honey, which would also, I would think, have great benefits for you. And that would be an easy way to imbibe it, too. Sure. Yeah, you could do a little spoonful of turmeric and honey. Which, that's a good idea. Um, the next, we've heard before, dark colored fruits and vegetables because of the antioxidants. As we age, the body's ability to produce antioxidants actually declines. So it's important to get them. So an example would be uh, kale for vegetable, leafy green, and then blueberries for fruit. And aronia berries, which does have the most antioxidants out of any berry in the world is what I hear. Um, and they have, they're at the local farmer's market right now in Iowa. Yeah, the only thing about aronia berries is you just can't pick up a handful of them and eat them. That 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 doesn't work. Yeah, so. they're they're bitter, kind of like cranberries. So what I do, I actually just put a handful of in my smoothie with other stuff, and with your and kale, that, with my kale, <laughs> it's fabulous. Okay, and the next salmon and sardines, fatty fish for better concentration and alertness. The um, DHA and EPA, the omega three fatty acids, is very good. And then uh, walnuts, which I might add, look like little brains. Um, they have omega-3s and vitamin E. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. And also chia, hemp, and flax. Steve, don't cringe. <laughs> they also have omega-3s in them. I think also when we go back to the fish, I think it's really important to emphasize that wild-caught is what we should be looking for. Um, I, I wouldn't think, uh, I certainly don't have any scientific evidence to prove it, but I wouldn't think that farm-raised fish would be... Um, overly uh, exciting to your brain. Certainly not overly exciting to your taste buds. Yeah, the ideal choice is, is wild cut. All right, so are there other ways to boost mental alertness and decrease our risk for dementia? Yeah, so exercise. Um, again, cardiovascular exercise especially is great for the heart, the blood vessels, and the brain. So I recommend definitely uh, consistent exercise, aerobic activity. And then next, to exercise your mind, regular social interaction and learning keeps your mind sharp. Really important to keep doing that um, throughout your life. And then last, especially if you, um, well, all of us want to have mental clarity and focus. If you have a, a big day at the office, um, if you have to get a lot of work done, eat breakfast. You know, I think it's... it's Smoothie. What? Yeah, <laughs> smoothie. Smoothie, it's good for, you know, digestion. Um, when you have, when you uh, wake up, you're breaking a fast. So to have a smoothie, have something. 
I think it's important for, um, at least in my experience, um, to have, and a lot of health experts will agree, to have something for breakfast. It is funny, isn't it, about breakfast, because some people just refuse to eat breakfast. And I was reading a book the other day, and the Italian grandmother didn't believe in breakfast, and um, her nephew asked her why, asked him her why, and, and she said, no one should eat anything until they've put in a decent day of work. Wow. <laughs> But what if they could do better work with breakfast? <laughs> really? That's what, that's what I thought. Anyway, what action step can we take? So all those foods that I mentioned, the blueberries, the kale, the salmon, the green tea, I recommend trying to add those in um, to your weekly diet and focus on adding in all the good stuff. All right. That's our health coach, Emily Rose Shaw. You can find her at emilyroseshaw.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So... Everybody feel healthier? Good. Excellent. Oh, and smarter. I like that. Okay, that's that's really good. That That's fantastic. So, let's see. Do we have any brain food on the menu? We have salmon, wild coho salmon. Excellent. Okay, and the rest of it, I'm not sure if it's brain food or not, but it's going to be delicious. So, that's what we're going to do. The menu we have is how many people here, for example, when they were growing up and they had to eat at a cafeteria, right when they were in school and Fridays they always served like what they said was fish but I'm sure it wasn't with tartar sauce I mean were you just like totally like please get that away from me so we're going to learn how to make real tartar sauce they've already made mayonnaise fresh no jarred mayonnaise around here and we're going to have something delicious tartar sauce and also tortillas but we're going to make tortillas with masa harina. Too many, I would say that when you go out, almost any time you go to a restaurant that purports to be a Mexican restaurant, you're going to get served flour tortillas. I don't know where those came from. I'm sure they came somewhere from Mexico, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe they came from Texas. But real tortillas are made with masa harina. And masa harina is a uh, very interesting um, type of preparation because what it is is it's traditional flour that's used to make tortillas, and tamales and other Mexican dishes, and what they do is they take maize, field corn, right, and they dry it and then they treat it in a solution of lime and water, and this loosens the hulls from the kernels and softens the corn, and the lime reacts with the corn, and I don't know if everybody knows this or not, so that the nutrient in the corn, niacin, can actually be assimilated by the digestive tract, because without that, it's not happening. So you're not getting the nutrition that you need so from corn. So if you're really doing it right, you're using fresh masa harina. So it's, a, it's like a dough. Um, I don't think that's very possible around here. But if you're in Chicago and going to, say, for example, one of Rick Bayless's restaurants, Topola Bombo, Frontera Grill, or uh, Shoko, you're going to get masa harina that's actually made from a fresh dough. Otherwise, you can use dried, which is what we're using, and uh, that's it's great. You just add some water, and you can make delicious tortillas and tamales. So that's what we're going to do. Plus salsa. We're going to have salsa, lots of fresh stuff. It's it's really, I would call it, I, I think, I don't know my Mexican terminology as well, but I would call it pico de gallo more than salsa because we're going to be chopping up fresh vegetables and, and corn and tomato. I mean, sorry, tomatoes and onion and cilantro and uh, all that stuff, jalapenos, and making a little salsa with that. So with us, Kelly Kinsler, Savannah Strode, Corey Remington, all from Indian Hills. And and what? Cody. Didn't I say that? Cody Remington? Corey. Oh, my gosh. I can't even read. Cody. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to butcher your you know. So tell us. You, you've never been here, so we're glad to welcome you to Great Taste. And I know you don't want to talk, so we're going to make you talk for just a minute. So are are you a beginning student at culinary school? No. No, this is my fourth term. Fourth term. Okay, so fourth term, and how's it going? Uh, very well. Are you enjoying it? Very. And do you feel like this is something that you want to do when you graduate? You want to be a cook, or you, what do you want to do, actually? Um, probably going to catering. So, you know, start my own business, cater people. Sounds good. Cater people or food? Food both, oh. you know. <laughs> Cater to people with your food. I love that. That's yeah. that's beautiful. And do you have any, is there any particular food that you like, you know, that you like to focus on or are you just totally open? Open. Just anything, everything. 
And has there been one thing that you found so far in your four terms that you really just kind of just excited your imagination? Not really. <laughs> Cody, that's all right, buddy. We're gonna, we're gonna talk to Gordon and we're gonna see if we can get you get get you to find something that you really are excited about. But I like the fact that you're you like it all, so that's great. And you're struggling with that wine bottle right now, and yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna happen eventually. I think I think it will. All right, Savannah, what's going on? I am making salmon today. I'm making two different kinds. Um, our first kind is a Moroccan grilled salmon, and our next kind is an oven poached salmon fillet. You're going to trust that oven? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <am>. good luck. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so Moroccan, I, that sounds really intriguing. What What is going to make it Moroccan? Is it the spices that you're using? Um, it's the spices and also what we're kind of marinating it in. We're marinating it in uh, yogurt, which is kind of like an... How to say it, but it's know. it's a it's a Middle Eastern spice, uh, okay. Middle Eastern method. Yes. Sure, yogurt that'll be great. Yeah. Um, where is that? I want to see where is it marinating. It's got to be around here someplace, huh? It's in the fridge. Actually. It's in the fridge. Okay, that's fine. Um. And what are the spices that you're going to use? Uh, cumin and coriander. Mm. Two of my absolute favorites. So it's great. What? Why are you <laughs> laughing over there? Kelly, why are you laughing about? I want to hear. I want to know what you're laughing about. I'm attempting to push this cutting board, unlike at the school that has grips on it, so it's pushing me instead. Very interesting. And is that your mayo, huh? Yes, I was trying to get it underneath the oh, mirror so, so people can, can see. see. It? All right. Well, we'll we'll let you continue to struggle with that while people can look at it. All right. So, uh, what what are you, what are your tips as far as cooking salmon? I mean, because for me, as I was mentioning to you guys before the show. One one of the things about salmon that's I think really important is that you don't cook it very much because there's nothing worse almost to me than dried salmon. Yeah, you really don't want to cook overcook salmon because it's kind of a more valuable and expensive fish, and it, the flavor it gives out is just so much better than a lot of other fish choices that you can get. So you don't want to ruin it. So just kind of cooking it till it's about medium rare, rare. It's about perfect for it. So. Yes, I agree with you. That sounds that sounds really good. So I'll be very anxious to to see what happens. Now, are you marinating marinating it with the spices and the yogurt together? Yes. Okay, and so about how long? Uh, twenty to thirty minutes. Twenty to thirty minutes, and it's just simply yogurt, cumin, and coriander. Anything else in there? Lemon juice, salt, and pepper, and smashed garlic. Mmm, it's getting better. It's getting better each time. I'm I'm really enjoying that. Okay, so now, Kelly, what are you up to? I've been working on the tartar sauce. I've got the mayo to where everybody can see it, I think. Are we good? Everybody can see the mayo, even those people out there listening. That's awesome. You, you have quite quite style if you can he- help those people out in the radio. I'm a magician. Mm-hmm. It's okay. All right. <laughs> You're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, and this is 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio coming to you live from the High Beat Club Room. We're talking with Kelly Kinsler, one of the students from the Indian Hills Coloring Arts Program, and homemade tartar sauce. Mm hmm. That's what I'm attempting. <laughs> All right. So. Mayonnaise. Here's the here's the recipe. One cup of mayonnaise, one quarter cup of sour cream, one tablespoon of minced red onion, one teaspoon of sweet pickle relish, one half lemon juiced, a pinch of cayenne, a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of coarse ground black pepper, and all you're going to do, really simple, is in a bowl mix all the ingredients together until well incorporated, cover it and refrigerate until it's ready to use. Now, how long will that last fresh? Well, it's it's an egg product, so you wouldn't want to go over a week with it. It'll start to separate within a couple of days, so use it as soon as you make it. Okay, now if it starts to separate in the fridge and you bring it out, can you put it back together again? Um, Sometimes it'll go back together if you stir it. you have to whip it up again, but a lot of the times it'll just stay separated and you'll just have to get rid of it and make a new batch. Okay, and the reason it's an egg-based product is because of the mayo. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Okay, so, and I know we've talked about this over and over again, but you want to give the recipe, basic recipe for homemade mayonnaise? For homemade mayonnaise, it's just one egg yolk or two to three, however much of that flavor that you want, and a cup of mayo, or oil, your choice of oil, and then just, it emulsifies, and an emulsification is when two substances that don't go together do. And you have to add that oil very slowly, right? Very. 
very or, slowly. Or, or you have wet egg. Or you have a kitchen aid where you can just use your whip and make it up in a few minutes. All right, but you still have to add the oil slow, otherwise it won't emulsify. And can you do that in a food processor also? Um, I never have. Um, one of my classmates had, so I know it works. Right, and a blender? Yes. Yeah, as long as you just follow the same procedure, right? You have to add the oil very slowly, right? And then you use a little bit of salt, and you can also, if you want to, you can flavor it with all kinds of different things if that's something that you'd like to do. Oh, yeah. We spent a whole class period making different flavored oil concoctions and then adding them to egg to make flavored mayo. So it's, it's interesting. You can eat it with chips or whatever you want. And again, how long can you take that flavored mayo, forget about being in tartar sauce, but just by itself, is it the same principle of about a week? Yeah, it's, it's the same because it'll separate. Okay, so that's, that's just fine. Now, I'm really excited because you guys are going to make homemade tortilla chips? Yeah, we're going to try. I've never actually made flour or uh, corn tortillas before, so... <laughs> you, I think I told. I think I've. I think I. You know, you're not supposed to admit that. But if it doesn't turn out, I don't want to pretend like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That that that's fine. So is that the that's the masa harina? Yes, this is. This is it mixed with water, and that's all it is. So all you're doing is you're taking and you're pres you're taking the masa, and I think what you're going to be doing is about three quarters of a cup of masa harina and two three quarters of a cup about an eighth of a cup of water did you stick to that pretty much yes i did okay and then what did you do you mixed it up together and then did you knead it with your hands a little bit just to make sure it was all mixed together and now it's supposed to sit wrapped tightly for 30 minutes all right so we're going to let it do that and then we're going to then we're going to enjoy it all right now as far as the salsa is concerned Oh wait! Into the I see you're starting to work on that tartar sauce, huh? All right, we'll, we'll let you we'll let you do that. And while you do that, I want to mention something that's pretty darn exciting. And I just I think I lost I lost it. It was the fact that, and maybe Jan can tell us a little bit about this. We'll see. And that is that uh, Market on Main. I think that they've actually broken ground and it's it's ready to rock and roll, right? We got our shovels out earlier this week. So, yes, we actually did break ground. Um, they've got about a $3 million um, renovation of a very old Main Street building that they'll be working at all winter, and it should be open in the spring for business. That fast? That fast, yeah. The, actually, the construction people said December 31, they'd be done. Then it'll just this, be fixtures. So for the benefit of those people who don't know about the project, maybe you could just describe it really quickly. Okay. Market on Main is in downtown Ottumwa, Iowa. It's about 20 miles from here. And um, it's a new food hub that's starting there. So what they're doing is encouraging farmers and growers to bring produce into this new food hub. It will have a retail uh, section where farmers can just bring stuff in and sell it to the store, and they will resell from wholesale to retail. Um, there will also be a section for booths if you want to have a freezer sec, you know, of meat sitting there or a refrigerated part of vegetables sitting there or some other food product that you process. You can have a booth of your very own and you rent that by the month. And then there will also be the regular farmer's markets on Wednesday and Saturday. They're in the parking lot as well as inside the store. So it'll be kind of a mix. And the Indian Hills Culinary Arts students will be also doing demonstrations and uh, doing classes on certain aspects of cooking uh, throughout the week and some demonstrations of foods that are common, uh, like the salsa that we're doing tonight, um, will be happening out in the main uh, arena during the day. So it'll be a really interesting project. And will there be essentially space for people who want to actually cook and sell food there too to the public? There will. It's it's meant to be all local food. It will probably take a year or two till it's all local. Um, so there will be some food coming in from outside, especially in the winter for the first couple of years. But we're really expecting that growers will step up and um, fill the shelves um, with all of their stuff. And yes, a lot of processed um, food will be in there too. We're actually looking forward to having a processing kitchen where a, a grower could go in even now and... Um, for example, uh, freeze green beans or make salsa and freeze it. 
and then that would be into the inventory of the store in the long run, and that could be sold out throughout the winter too. So there are things like that that we'd like to really see happening, and, and part of it is an entrepreneurial venture where we're hoping that um, growers that are interested in business or, or processors that are interested in growing their business will start really sp spending time using that kitchen very well and processing things and, and putting them out for sale on the shelves. By the way, we're talking with Jan Swinton. She's our hometown harvest coordinator and coordinator for 13 counties. 13 now, yes. I'm a busy girl. <laughs> okay, so now is this concept... This has been going on for, I know Chef Raider at Indian Hills has been working on this for, it seems like, two years at least. Yeah, it's been a long time. I've been on the steering committee for most of that time. And one of the frustrations that we have with the whole process is that there are not enough growers in the area. And so we have been really working on getting more growers and getting the growers that are there to work up to capacity and and trying to really fill in the gaps in that. And some of that will come from outside the county. Um, Mahaska County is Oskaloosa, and there will be growers from there that will come to Ottumwa. Some of the Fairfield growers and processors will bring their stuff to Ottumwa. It's that sort of thing. The, the main street in Ottumwa is um, probably not the best part of town. And so there's a fairly high um, poverty rate and uh, free and reduced lunch rate at the schools right in that area. And so there will be a, a SNAP and a WIC program even within this retail outlet. And that's part of the funding is because we see that as a food desert in downtown Ottumwa. But I think it's great because actually what's happening, it, this could be a real turning point mm -hmm. for that whole downtown area, revitalizing it. Yeah, there are some really nice things going into that Main Street right now, and this will be one of the really nice things. And so we really are trying to um, find ways that um, the uh, community that lives there can actually use this outlet. It's not meant to be a high, expensive, gourmet uh, food place, but it is meant to be fresh local. And so we're trying to find ways to really make that happen for a lot of people and even possibly uh, g give people some employment opportunities in the kitchens, doing processing um, on days when there's not food demonstrations and classes going on. Why aren't we processing food all day? And so we'll have to schedule those in advance. And the gal who's our new... Um, coordinator of the whole project is awesome. She was a high V dietitian for a number of years. She's young and energetic and from Ottumwa originally. And so she has a lot of good connections and she's been really, really hitting the social media with this stuff. And so I was thrilled that yesterday, right after it came out in the paper, I had two or three emails from people saying, oh, I saw your picture on the in the paper. And I, I didn't know it'd even be out. I'd hardly left the store, you know, so it was really good. She's doing a great job. Well, it's great because it, it's really a uh, fascinating just watching over the years the essentially the vitalization. I don't want to call it revitalization because I'm not sure that it was vital, <laughs> but the vitalization of the food scene in Iowa on the producer level and now more and more on the consumer level and hopefully the restaurant level will will pick up. And you have uh, have you been up to Cedar Rapids? I'm sure you have to Nubo up there. Yeah, we're going to, act, as a group, the Market on Main Steering Committee is going next week again. Um, we were up there at Christmas when they first opened, and uh, it's a very interesting market. There, It's a real challenge to keep the crowd coming week after week after week and day after day after day when they're when they're open. And so um, that will be a challenge in Ottumwa as well. Okay, That's and this, this is the same type of principle, right, in Cedar Rapids, Nubo? Yep, it's a food hub, and over the winter they were just – kicked it off and got started with the indoor part, but now they have actually a farmer's market that meets twice a week in their parking lot and outside. And so it also has kids' activities, a little kid's garden and, and face painting and butterfly looking and all that sort of thing. And so um, it, it's bringing in a lot of different aspects. It's meant to be entertainment and fun and learning experience for everybody. That sounds terrific. Thank you, Jan, very much. All right. I think it's time to uh, talk with... Our resident food film star. Is that right? Film star? No, actually, more, more, more of just f food and film and tell us a little bit about it. Cinebites with Beverly Merson. And I'm really excited because you mentioned the title of your little segment is what? Two Greedy Italian. Two Greedy Italians. Okay, tell us a little bit about that. Well, Two Greedy Italians, it's a BBC series. And it's two Italian men that lived in Italy about 40 years ago. Um, one, 
one one of his um, Antonio Carluccio. He's about an Italian who's about seventy eight years old. He left Italy. Um, what he said in his twenties. And Gennaro Contaldo. And what they do is they um, Antonio had a very famous restaurant in London. And what they do is they go back to Italy and they do a series in different. Re they do a series taking a region from Italy. And this last series I saw was they did Calabria. And they're funny. They're very, very funny. They call themselves Tuguri Tent. They'll stop in the middle of the road and they'll, they'll pull um, fruit off the trees from an orchard. And they say, we just love to eat. And they do really interesting subjects. They'll blend the old with the new. They like to show the old Italy and they'll flash different pictures from different towns from the old and they'll bring the new. And when they were in Calabria, the, the thing that I love about the show is they're always cooking over an open fire, so no matter what they're doing. And the shots, the photography is beautiful. You really feel after the show that you've been in Italy and you've experienced it on every level, especially on the um, food level. So when they were in Calabria, they did um, a menu of Italian pasta made from wild blueberries. So instead of using squid to create the color, they used wild blueberries, which was really a twist on a pasta with the color. The other thing, speaking of fish, of which it seems to be the main subject tonight, they did a fish, a five fish soup with um, a crust, a crustia at the bottom. And the five fish that they used were, which was, I found absolutely um, fascinating, was scallops, sea bass, monkfish, prawn fish, and a rock fish which um, is a bottom feeder, and they said it really gives a lot of taste. And they said with the zuppa, you can't forget your bread at the bottom. And then they finished off with an orange rice cake. And um, these two gentlemen, they're very expressive, they're passionate, they're funny. And one of the things I was really fascinated in one show they talked about when they were in Calabria was they went to a school and they saw how the children are starting. Before they said the grandma was the soul of the family. And she made sure everybody ate. And as a matter of fact, one of the things they said was the grandmother never sat down to eat until it was dessert time. And they said the grandma, the mother, the, it's changing. The mother is also going out to work. And um, the, ch the families are starting to be only have one child in a family now. So these children don't eat the way they used to. And some are eating at school. And they're not even set up in schools to eat properly. So um, they talked about that. And then they're really, the government's now starting to encourage children to eat properly again. And they interviewed this priest who is doing an after program school with this, he built a brick oven, outdoor brick oven beside his church. And the children go after school and they make bread. And they make all kinds of breads. And you just see them filming the children, having fun. It's like Play-Doh. It's a therapy almost, putting their hands into the dough, playing with it, stretching it, making all kinds of bread in every type of shape. So I really, really would like to encourage you. You'll enjoy it. It is so scenic. The photography is out of this world. They're driving around in an old, like, Cinca, Cinca, Cinque, what's it called? Cinquecento. Uh, yeah, Cinquecento. Cinquecento. Right. Fiat. Old, old one to um, a um, Gambard, Zam, I can't, Lamborghini. A Lamborghini. They drive around. And that, that is definitely a spread. <laughs> yeah, the, the spread is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to just tell you one other fascinating story that I, they went into, um, they go back and visit their old friends, the families in different parts, and they went into this lady's house. And these bunch of women, they were making, they were rolling the pasta, and they were making them into all different shapes. So it was all fresh pasta. And they said what they used to do was these women would get paid to make fresh pasta. A merchant would come and get it, sell it, and then they would get the money from the fresh pasta and go and buy the dry pasta. Isn't that? Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. That and that. Oh. Well, as we know, Gisela, who is here, you know, she's not a fan of. It, it, it's really interesting. I mean, she's not a fan of fresh pasta. And yeah, uh, fresh pasta that. has a very, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a little bit different preparations in terms of the kind of things that you use with it. And um, I, ca I can see where, you know, depending upon, you know, what area of the country you come from, 
and she was from the north of Italy, right on the Swiss border, and they never had, I, they never used fresh pasta there. So, Steve, even though I'm a vegetarian, I do have to talk about this one thing. They said in the old days, everybody had a pig in their family, and it was a pet pig, even though they would take an end to its life at some point. But they said nothing gets wasted. So they showed what they did with this pig from the snout all the way to the tail. And one of the things I was really fascinated by was how they made chocolate blood pudding. And um, the kids, they didn't even realize it. It tasted like chocolate pudding, but they didn't want to waste the blood from the pig. And they would put the blood, sorry, everybody has a look on their face. But it's when you see the talk about it and how they do it, it's absolutely fascinating. And they would make chocolate blood pudding that looked, actually, it looked delicious, believe it or not. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of um, elements here that are really important. And one of those elements is that, uh, like the American Indian, for example, you know, animals were considered sacred. And so if you were going to take the animal's life, it was your responsibility to utilize every part of that animal to essentially give that animal's life, you know, in, in the way that you were looking at it, purpose, exactly, and, and sacred, exactly, making it sacred. So, Steve, with this series, with the two greedy Italians, you could watch it on YouTube, and you're really learning so much about food uh, and cooking as you're really learning about each region of Italy. And is this series going on right now, or is it in the past? I mean, can you watch it on BBC America, for example? You could watch it on YouTube. Just put in Two Greedy Italians, and you'll see their different series. They show Series 1, and they show, show Series 2. Fantastic. Thanks, Bev, so much. I'm really, really excited about that myself. So, And one of the really cool things, actually, since you brought it up, I think you've caused me to think a little bit, because when... Food Network first started quite a few years ago. They actually had really relevant programming where they actually taught you things, and it was fa fascinating. And, of course, now it's become mostly reality TV. But if you have the cooking channel on your um, cable or uh, your satellite, whatever, the cooking channel is re-showing most of those old series. So you can watch Alton Brown and Good Eats, and you can watch Molto Mario, and you can watch um, just all of the really – the series that had a lot of substance to it and learned so much from watching them uh, create these dishes right in front of your eyes. So I highly recommend that. It's very, very fascinating. You're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Voss, and this is 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio. Speaking of Italy, I want to mention that Gisela Isidori, who's our dear friend, will be back on October the, I think it's the 16th. It's a Wednesday, I believe, and we, so we've already planned it. Giselle was here last week, of course, and we had a completely full house, and everyone was so thrilled to have her, and so she's definitely coming back on the 16th of October. And uh, one of the things that Giselle is doing May 17th to the 26th is she's taking a group of people, lucky people, I would say, to Italy to experience a lot of things that Beverly was talking about because we're going to, the, the people that are going on the tour are going to be actually be able to uh, cook with some great chefs. They're also going to be actually going to a lot of different producers, organic producers of cheese and wine and all kinds of uh, wheat and, and many other things. And they're going to go out, for example, into a, a huge herb garden with 400 different varieties with a chef and actually gather herbs with that chef and go back to her restaurant and cook. So all that is uh, very exciting for the trip. It's in Emilia Romagna. It's an exploration of one region of Italy, very intense um, in terms of just an exploration of that one region. And that's with Gisela, May 17th to 26th. And if you want more information on that tour, you can just email me at s. That's Steve, S, boss, B-O-S-S, at M-E.com, me.com. And if you don't already get the Great Taste e-letter, sign up for it by going to greattasteradio.com, and you can get our weekly e-letter. And by the way, just to make that more interesting, from starting next week, no longer, I'm not going to be putting recipes any longer on the website uh, of the station. It's all going to be in the e-letters. So if you want, if you want the recipes, you're going to have to subscribe to get it. So that'll be fun. But I might just put a recipe or two up on the on the on the blog post. We'll see. I mean, I, I don't want to be selfish, but a anyway, the the e-letter again. Go to greattasteradio.com and you can sign up right there. All right, Tom Allen, 
So good to see you. Oh, wow. How about that? You, you're developing quite a reputation. I'm not sure it's good, but. Well, uh, let's just stick to the subject here. <laughs> <laughs> and the subject is. You know, that was one of the comments, the Whitey Bulger uh, trial. Uh, and it, there was he's a big gangster in Boston, and and the defense tried to put the government on. Wait, wait is this the subject? No, I, I, I'm talking about staying with the subject. The defense tried to put the, gov- the government on trial, and so the 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 prosecution said, "Stick to the subject. You know, keep your eye on the ball." Okay, and, Tom. So uh, so let's go back to music. We could do that, <laughs> and we've got fish on our brain. Is that right? Well, this is a song about not so much sea fish, but uh, domestic fishing. It's a song about fishing. Fishing? Fishing. Fishing in the dark. You and me go fishing in the dark. All right. Lazy yellow moon coming up tonight, shining through the trees. Crickets are singing and the lightning bugs are floating on the breeze. Baby, get ready. Across the field where the crick turns back by the old stump road. I'm gonna take you to a special place that nobody knows. Baby, get ready. Oh, you and me go fishing in the dark, lying on our backs and counting the stars where the cool grass grows. Down by the river in the full moonlight You'll be falling in love in the middle of the night Just moving slow Staying the whole night through Feels so good to be with you Spring is almost over and the summer's come And the days are getting long Waited all winter for the time to be right Just to take you along Baby, get ready. And it don't matter if we sit forever and the fish don't bite. Jump in the river and cool ourselves from the heat of the night. Baby, get ready. Oh, you and me go fishing in the dark, lying on our backs and counting the stars where the cool grass grows. Down by the river in the full moonlight We'll be falling in love in the middle of the night Just moving slow Staying the whole night through Feels so good to be with you and me Go fishing in the dark Lying on our backs and counting stars And the cool grass grows Down by the river in the full moonlight We'll be falling in love in the middle of the night Just moving slow Staying the whole night through Feels so good to be with you Tom, that was awesome. That was awesome. I'm glad you stuck to the subject. Yeah, we were on the subject of fishing and uh, no fish stories, please. <laughs> That's great. Speaking of fish stories, what's going on? I mean, is there any fishing going on back here? Any fish stories happening? Um, Not yet. We're still waiting for the grill to preheat and the fish to continue marinating okay so now i see we have some we have some what will soon be tortillas tortillas and then tortilla chips Mm. so now did you i I was watching you out of the corner of my eye and you and Corey did everything cody Cody. yeah i did that (laughs) now I, i heard myself that time cody and and you actually formed all these with your fingers didn't you yes we did now was it easy Uh, you know one of the things that occurred to me was that with just an eighth of a cup of water it seems like it (laughs) it seems like that they might be a little uh dry might maybe hard to work with but but that that's amazing that such a small amount of water would work um it's actually almost equal portions it was one and three quarters to of the flour to one and an eighth cup of water. Well, wait, you you used more because, but but the basic recipe, which I had here, I wonder what happened to all my pieces of paper. They're all. Did somebody take? Oh, here it is. Yeah, 
one and three quarters cups of masa to one and an eighth cups of water. Do you know what? I think that mine seemed to have the one cut off. I think that I only had one eighth on mine, which is kind of weird, but that's okay. You know, that's, that's, uh, all right. Anyway, so how does this, how does this feel? Does it feel pretty dry? No, not bad. So I think if you had a, a tortilla press, you could probably get them thinner though, right? Yes, um, tortilla press was suggested, but I don't own one. I don't know anyone that does. So, But I think that's great because did everybody get to see, I, obviously not the people who are listening, but you got to see them actually working this dough with their fingers. So that's just awesome. So I think that that is terrific. Okay, so we have lemon slices here. So there, we know that something's going to happen eventually with, with the fish, right? Maybe, if we get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that, that's coming up soon. And what about your salsa? How's that, how's that doing? We're about to start it right now, actually. Cody's got the onions in the roto coop. Okay, so now if you don't have a robo coop in your house, which not too many people do, because that's more a commercial type of machine, what should we use? Um, a blender will work, or... Um, that other word that I can thank you. Food processor. Food processor. <laughs> okay, so either blender or food processor. And what do you want to do to be, I think that if you're not careful, you can make this, you can obliterate it basically. And, and you kind of want to have nice texture, don't you? You, don't, you want, don't want everything to be blended all up. You want stuff that's kind of chewy, right? Right. Um, I prefer to like at the end cut the tomatoes by hand. Some people just throw them in the food processor or blender. If you do that, put the tomatoes in last, otherwise they will be mush. So everything else can go in first, and then just pulse it a little bit, and then add your tomatoes at the end. Okay, so everything else is onion, and jalapeno, and cilantro, and garlic, and did I miss anything? That's it. Okay, so that's perfect. You know, one thing that I was thinking about, especially at this time of the year, which could be cool, is after you get finished, and you add, you know, you've chopped your tomatoes up by hand, and you've put those in. How about some fresh corn from Corn on the Cob where you just cut it off? That would be really fun, wouldn't it? That could. I mean, I'm sure people have done that. I don't care for my salsa variations like some people do. I, I just like mm, Kind of stuck, huh? I am. <laughs> I am. All right. I like the corn. Anyway, that, that, sounds, that sounds really good. Oh, here's my little thing here. And, and it was, let's see, just to just check it out here. Uh, one and three quarter cups to one and an eighth cups. I just need to learn to read better. That's all. So one of the things I want to mention is that you can make flour tortillas, and I'm going to give you a simple recipe for that that the ladies supplied me with. Three cups of all-purpose flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, four to six tablespoons of lard or vegetable shortening. Did you come up with a substitute for lard and vegetable shortening? Uh, no. I didn't. We changed it to flour or corn tortillas, so I didn't keep looking. You can use butter. It'll work. I'm, I'm sure it will. And uh, one and a quarter cups of warm water, and that's approximate. And all you have to do is just blend the flour, the baking powder, and the salt together, and put the shortening or the butter in. You can cut. You can cut the butter and then mix it in with your your hands, kind of like when you were doing a pie dough. That's that's the best way to do it. Um, so then you add the water all at once and mix the dough quickly with a fork or by hand until the dough forms a mass. I, I like my fingers to get in there, so it's much more fun that way. And then once it does, you can work it in the bowl, moving it around the sides to pick up any remaining flour that's in the bowl, and then knead the dough by folding it in half, pushing it down and folding it again. I'm sure everybody knows how to do that. And you only have to do it till about a dozen times until it isn't sticky any longer. And then after that, I would let it rest for about a half hour, cover it and let it rest for about a half hour. Now, typically, these tortillas are cooked on what's called a comal, which is a griddle, smooth, flat griddle that's typically used in Mexican, uh, in Mexico and Central America to cook tortillas. And they also use it to cook meat. But here, no reason to go out and buy one. You can just get a cast iron, you know, flat cast iron um, griddle. That, that'll take care of it. And uh, most everybody has one of those, or if they don't, they can easily pick one up. Makes it very simple and, and easy to do. Now, let's, let's talk about something that uh, I wanted to mention today because it was something that actually occurred to me. I was reading, I, I read a lot of food stories, and I was reading about, all the time you're reading about chefs transforming ingredients. And all of a sudden, I was sitting down today, and I just had this 
realization that I don't really want to transform ingredients. I want the ingredients to just tell me who they are and speak to me, like we've talked about so many times. I don't want to make the ingredients into something else. I want them just to be who they are and to just yell all their wonderful characteristics to me from, from what I make. So in the last couple of days, what I've done is, is try to really focus on that a little bit. So I've made a, a wonderful vegetable stew, essentially summer vegetable stew, because it's just the time of year when there's such a proliferation of zucchini and yellow squash and wonderful sweet peppers and even hot peppers. And I've taken all those and just cut them up into nice little pieces and uh, diced up a little onion and a little garlic and lots of fresh rosemary, lots of fresh rosemary. And if you want to see one of the most beautiful sights in terms of uh, cooking, I think, is to take your olive oil and get it a little warm in a pan and then just throw in rosemary and just watch it turn this absolutely gorgeous bright green as it just gets saturated with the oil and just starts to come alive and all the flavors start to come out of it. Anyway, so rosemary, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of onion, kind of get that cooked a little bit until it just starts to color. And then add to that all of your vegetables. You know, I was using a trombuccino squash, which is a little bit more dense and takes a little longer to cook than typical zucchini. Uh, yellow squash or green zucchini. So start that first. So take the trombuccino and put that in to your pan first so that you can get that cooked and get started before you add your yellow squash and your green squash. Now some people are more particular than I am and they want that texture to be there and have that zucchini really have a, a little bite to it still. Whoa. We'll talk about that in just one second. Uh, and, uh, but, but I'm not as particular Anyway, once that, that had cooked and I had, of course, salt and pepper in there, I actually took a, some beautiful fresh ricotta uh, that uh, was just delicious, whipped r fresh ricotta. I took salt and pepper and olive oil and mixed it into the fresh ricotta, and then I just spooned it on top of all these vegetables. And it was absolutely outstanding and so simple and so quick to do very very fast and I think that there, there's also a difference interestingly enough we've gotten over the last few years so much of this 30 minute meals thing and so many of those recipes are buy some frozen ravioli and <laughs> and, and boil some water okay. well yeah I guess we can make meals in 30 minutes that way that's really really simple to do but you can actually make fresh meals all you have to do is give it a little bit of thought to it and you can come out with some great things that let ingredients speak to you and tell you all about them. And this was, again, inspired. I was reading an article about this chef in Australia. Fascinating article. <laughs> Very fascinating. I wish I could remember exactly where he was from because there's an Australian in the audience here. Uh, but it was in uh, a Bon Appetit so a couple of months ago, I think, Bon Appetit, the sandwich issue. But it was a very fascinating article because he cooks with ingredients that are local, which is, of course, the most wonderful thing to be able to do. And some of these ingredients are not found anywhere else. And he transforms those ingredients because he wants, he, he, he transforms them so that they fit with many other ingredients that he's serving in the restaurant. And that I, I love. I love that experience because at a restaurant, you don't need somebody at a restaurant to do what I just told you about, where you cook some vegetables and you put some ricotta with it, salt and pepper and some olive oil. I mean, you don't need to pay somebody to do that. You can do that yourself. But at a restaurant, a great experience at a restaurant is to go and have some food that you couldn't possibly ever create in your own home. It's just not something that's going to happen. So, uh, very interesting article, and I'll try to I'll try to remember to um, to uh, uh, cite that article in the next um, blog post. Anyway, Savannah, do you want to come up here and tell us a little bit about this wonderful, delicious, absolutely smelling salmon? Beautiful. This is this is your baked. Yeah, this is our oven poached salmon. Um, it's poached in a dry white wine. We found an organic one, so even better. Um, it's also got shallots, salt, and pepper on it. And to garnish it, you can use a lemon wedge, or you can get some herbs like parsley or cilantro. Um, you bake it at 425 for about 10 minutes. 
It really doesn't take long, and it's delicious. So. Okay, so did you taste it yet? Yes, I did. And so do I get a forkful? Yeah. And then do you want, but while it's still a little hot, you want to just, maybe you can dole some out to everybody, but I'd love to taste that. That looks so great. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty darn excited about it. Next week on Great Taste, there will be a, uh, um, a wonderful replay of a previous episode <laughs> as I take a week, a week of hiatus. And then the following week, we're back live with Matt Steigerwald from the Lincoln Cafe and the Lincoln Wine Bar. He'll be here in person, and our topic is corn. Matt's bringing a friend of his with, with him who is an expert on corn, and we're not talking about feed corn here. We're talking about corn, real corn, and, and that's going to be a, a very interesting thing. I'm trying to think of some really different types of things for uh, him to make with corn. I was reading about a corn dessert, and I'm thinking about asking him to try that. So give me one second right now, and I'm going to taste this. Mm. Delicious. Really good. Oh, it's got a little bit of kick to it, and I like that. Mm, very good. All right. Questions? Uh, today I went to the farmer's market on Wednesday, and I bought uh, this pie. This woman had these little turnovers in these pies, and we were talking about... Uh, um, ingredients that are natural so in the pie was aronia berries blueberries and peaches and it was so natural it wasn't too sweet thank god and the crust was like melt in your mouth and i shared it with all these people and it was just wonderful this woman just really knows how to bake she has, she has a red checkered uh, tablecloth if you see her buy what everything she's got I love that. But you know what I really loved about what you said is that you shared the food with everybody. And that's the whole thing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's what it is. It's not only cooking locally and, and cooking fresh, but it's actually sharing. The whole experience of sharing is, is what food is all about and the enjoyment of food is all about. So I can highly recommend that, that uh, everybody do that in their home kitchen. All right. So how's that salsa? Um, it turned out a little spicier than we liked, so we're going to add some more lime and lemon. I'm sticking my fork in, but it's the other side. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. We're going to check it out here. No, it just needs salt. It's a little spicy, but it's really good. And then half a lime, but, but definitely some salt. I agree. You know, the main thing about salsa, I think that's really, really important, is plenty of salt. Salsa, salsa is what you, garlic salt is processed, Jan. You, we got fresh garlic. We don't need garlic salt. So, <laughs> yes, I know you do. I know you have garlic in there. I was just, I was reprimanding Jan Swinton, that's all. No, no problem. So, lots of salsa, lots of salt in your salsa. And use sea salt because sea salt, of course, has all the minerals in it as opposed to just plain umbrella girl salt. We don't need to, umbrella girl salt is not the kind of salt you really want to use. So, uh, good sea salt that has all of the, Wonderful trace elements in it uh, that's harvested really, really nicely. Anybody have any questions that they want to ask the kids from Indian Hills while we're talking here? Anything else? All right, so homemade tartar sauce. We've got the masa harina that we use to make our tortillas. Now, how are you going to make these chips? I want to know, because right now you've got, you've got the tortillas, but how are you going to make the chips? Cut up the tortillas and fry them in some... Safflower oil. Okay, so basically what you've done is you've taken the, the masa cakes and you've cooked them in an, a cast iron pan. You, you've just covered it with a little bit of oil, right? Right. And you cooked them on both sides for about how long? About 30 seconds is what it said. They're still really soft, so I went a little bit longer, but 30 to 45 seconds. Okay, and then you're going to let them dry and you're going to let them cool a little bit before you cut them? Yeah, well, I didn't let those. I'm afraid if they cool too much, they'll get crisp, which they are starting to crisp. So I probably, I'll cut them right away. Okay, so now you're going to then cut them, and you can put them back in the oil and fry them uh, with, with essentially, completely fry them. Yes, make them all crunchy and chip-like. Crunchy and chip-like, I love that. And then we get to have some salsa with that. And wait, now you put your tomatoes in, it looks like. Yeah, everything's in there and ready to go. I thought you said you didn't like to put your tomatoes in. I don't. Cody was in charge today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. 
I don't want to get in between. I don't want to get everybody. I want to. I don't want to get anybody mad at me. So you know, you like to put your tomatoes in, though. I do. Turn turn this way, please. All right. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, you just like it all blended up. I do, actually. Yes. Okay. All right. That's fine. I think that it's going to taste delicious, and it looks like it has a great texture, which is which is really really nice. You've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. 60 minutes of delicious radio. We'll be back from High V live in two weeks with Matt Steigerwald of the Lincoln Cafe and the Lincoln Wine Bar. In between, we're going to have an archive show that was, I'm sure, fantastic when we first aired it. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure. Thank you, Indian Hills Culinary students. Really, really great. Please give them a big hand. And now, I'm sorry to say this to all of our friends who are listening, but it's time for us to eat, and we'll hope that you have plenty of great tastes on hand at your own home to enjoy. Great taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.